Amen. I'm reading from two passages in the Old Testament. One is Malachi, the old book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. The other is Isaiah 58. And Malachi 3, just one verse in Malachi, Isaiah 58, a few verses here and there, beginning from verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways, as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they? Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Thou seest not. Verse 6 is not this, the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him. And that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then, then, then shall thy light break. For as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, the speaking vanity. <coughs> and if, if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness shall be as the noonday, and the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in thought and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee 
with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And then one verse in Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. Chapter 3, verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now. Prove me now. Herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Initially, this verse seems to speak of God's people returning to faithfulness in tithing. But, in its exact context, this call from God is for His people to return to a life of no compromise or irregularity when it comes to dealing with money or anything related to finances or our material possessions. It is a call from God for His people to return to a life of no compromise or irregularity when it comes to dealing with money or finances or anything related to their material possessions. I knew a very godly man in my country, a very wealthy man and a very godly man in the land of South Africa. And he loves God. One of the companies he owns in our land is a bus company which transports multitudes of people from the rural areas to the cities, a great percentage being the poorer class, to find transport to their workplace when and if they can ever find work. And this man shared with me how the heads of the bus companies, of the major bus companies of our country, a number of years ago now, it was all in the newspapers, a big dispute, how they decided that they were going to increase the fares drastically. They wanted to double them because of the economy collapsing, because of the value of our currency becoming so less than what it had ever been. And so this great gathering in this conference of heads and managers and owners of the companies sat discussing how they were going to implement this and its repercussions. He said to them, at some point, we cannot do this. We dare not do this. No matter what you say of the economy or the value of our currency through devaluation, you're making good money. Be honest. You're making great money. My conscience will not allow me to increase the fares at all. I'm making profit enough. If we increase the fares, like you say, most of the people we deal with, it won't be worth their while going to work. Such a big cut of their salaries is taken just to get to the workplace. 
they may as well not go to work. They'll be left with nothing if you do this. And you know it. It will be blood money. And my conscience will not allow me to stand with you in this decision you're forcing. And there was great anger across that whole room, that whole center, at this man's stand of truth. He was belittled. He was rebuked. He was despised. And anger rose up against him that he trembled. He trembled at what was said to him and the reaction of the whole crowd of company owners. He almost had to crawl from that place That night, when he got back to his home, he got on his knees and he found himself weeping. He had been so publicly humiliated. And he opened the Bible at random, he said. And he found a tear falling on the page he opened on a verse that stunned him. He that showeth kindness or compassion to the poor lendeth to the Lord. And his heart flooded with peace and joy as a sovereign God made the page, the verse, the tears. Comfort him. Oh, God honors them that honor him, this book says. Well, they did double the fares throughout our land, and there was incredible grief across our country and protesting by the poor. I think he said within three years most of the bus companies were bankrupt. But he had trebled his profits. Think of that. Think of that. Most of the companies went bankrupt, out of business. But he had trebled his profits. Do you think this Bible exaggerates one word? When God says they that honor him, he will honor. Do you think that? That is something to question to slightly question in this world when it comes to finances to businesses that same man shared with me when I sat in his home a while ago what a blessing he has been to me when he was a younger man he had stores what you people would call supermarkets and he came to Christ as a younger man while he had all these supermarkets he found God in vital reality and his conscience from the next day the next day made him pull down all the tobacco all the cigarettes from the shelves and all the stores his conscience made him take all the alcohol wouldn't sell any more alcohol 
even the ingredients, the poorer class would come in their masses to these stores and buy all these ingredients to make their own alcohol. They couldn't afford over the counter what they charged. So they made all the ingredients that he knew, made, he stopped selling, he wiped out all so much of the contents of his shelves because of his conscience when he was saved. Oh, there was a lot of protesting, a lot of condemnation rose up even by religious people and leaders in the town who said, you've gone mad. You lose the business. You're going to go, you lose everything. You won't survive. What are you doing? Well, with all the protesting and the despising and the undermining of the stand he made, bringing him into the category of a fanatic, gone off his head virtually in the eyes of so many religious He did tremble. He did tremble. But then he said, Brother, at the end of that year, when the auditors closed the bookwork and balanced all the books, he had doubled his profit from any year he had made before profits. Double the profits. The following year, he had doubled that. Do you honestly believe that God doesn't honor men that honor Him? Could you doubt that, sir? When it comes to money, business sense, sensibilities concerning what works, makes you survive, what you collapse if you don't do. You have to compromise. The devil says, through religious compromising people. Oh, God honors them that honor him. Don't doubt that. Jenny's father is a farmer in one of the richest irrigation schemes of Africa where this great river flows through. And he, as a young man, met with God as a schoolboy. He was saved, but shallow. A lot of superficiality and not very deep. He inherited a farm along with all his brothers from the father who gave them pieces of land, all tobacco farming in this great Gamtus Valley in Africa. When he met with God as a Christian and found himself going deep with God through a sermon he heard where there was no compromise allowed, calling for you to absolute surrender, Andrew Murray says. Or you become a grief to God and man, though you're saved. He absolutely surrendered. He had a personal Calvary. He went all to God after these years of being a Christian, but not deep. The next day, he looked at his tobacco lands and he got on the tractors and he plowed the tobacco in the ground. And he planted vegetables. Well, that's tobacco land. The valley rose up in protest against what he's doing. You don't do vegetables. You, this is tobacco. There was virtually almost a violent protest rising up against him for what he was daring to do in that valley. Well, within a few years, 
he so prospered that 90% of that valley plowed their tobacco into the ground and planted vegetables. Do you honestly think God does not honor them that honor him? No compromise. No matter what the devil says, no matter what people who have business minds, people who have their pulse on the economy say, no matter what anyone says, God honors them that honor him, beloved. God honors them that beloved him, that honor him. My brother Dudley, he lives in Australia now. He used to live in America. My brother Dudley, when he was saved about 38 years ago now, he was really something for a young fellow just over 20. He was the South African champion of his sport. He had sports clubs across the land. He had his own business, which was just flourishing, booming. He really was staggering. Admired by multitudes who would come to all these clubs where he would train them and have people training them. He was asked to represent his country. When his country was sanctioned from the world, sport-wise, he was so good they couldn't do without him taking part. He had to come. No one in the world was this good. But what was the sport? Well, that was the beginning days of what took over in the world of young people of sport, karate, an eastern fighting system, mainly self-defense, but oh, oh. Anyway, he got mightily saved. And the next day, he said, I must close these clubs down now. Karate is of the devil, he said. He said, I don't care what anybody says. You speak to anyone who goes a little bit deep. This meditating... It's not just for concentration. It's for a power. And it's not God. And there is a power that takes hold of your senses as you go deeper. It's not of God. It's of the devil. And it's dangerous. And I'm stopping. He wouldn't go to represent his land. It was a shock. He closed all the clubs down. He said, I'm not making any money from this devilish thing anymore. Because all these people locked in their throngs to train under something of his supervision in these clubs. Oh, how many religious people opposed him. He's gone mad. Nothing wrong in this. It's, a, it's just good for the young people, you know. Oh, how many confessing, professing Christians stood up against him. Gone off the rails. Go too far here. Oh, the criticism, the barrage of criticism that rode up against him. The little encouragement he got was unbelievable from Christians, evangelical Christians. His business, flourishing, yes, for a young man, he stands up now, saved, within a week. He tells everybody, this business does not work on Sunday. I make no money from this business on Sunday. It's God's day. And I'm not desecrating God's day. The Lord's day. Well, then the criticism rose up. Oh, my. You're going to lose the business. His biggest dealers, the ones who gave him the most money with their contracts, the one man marched in when I was sitting there, shouting. He was like beside himself. He said, because you have become a religious fanatic, 
doesn't mean the whole world has come to a standstill, Dudley. He said, I give you my business, my contracts, and any other of them. We're all speaking about it. We're all shocked. If there's a breakdown, if there's a deadline to meet by Sunday, if you have our contracts, you work on Sunday. You will work on Sunday. Or you lose everything. I will take my business and I know everybody else is talking. We're getting away from you. You're going to lose everything. You've gone overboard, young man. He shouted at my brother. And I trembled at the way a man could speak to another man because of his love for God, what he had done. My brother stood up and he was trembling. I noticed that. He was just saved. He was young. And I noticed his little lips were quivering. And I looked at him and thought, what did you do now with your God? If you're going to lose everything, Dudley. tear came down his face and he said sir I don't care if I lose your business I don't care if I lose this business but I will not desecrate the Lord's day I love God too much unless it is a matter of life or death I will never again allow anyone in this business to work even if I lose this business. Well, what happened? Well, they might have found somebody that wouldn't work on a Sunday, but they also found somebody that's a very great rarity in the world, in the business world. They found someone in that they knew wouldn't overcharge them wouldn't do superficial work or undermine jobs wouldn't do any cheating on any level and what things he used in all the machinery there wouldn't be anything questionable about well instead of losing their business his business just grew and grew and grew and grew. He had to just take on workers upon workers and open up next door and next, hire the next building. It just went to such a state. In the end, God laid his hand on him to become a preacher and on me. And I remember my brother saying, thank God I'm getting out of all of this. It's too much. <laughs> he couldn't handle it. Oh, God honors them that honor him, beloved. No matter what the devil says to your biggest customer, threatening. No matter what the devil says to religious leaders, warning. You're going too far. This isn't, this isn't God. God honors them that honor him. This book says, and I believe it, in Pretoria, the capital of South Africa, I have come to love a young couple who have found Christ a few years ago. And they have businesses in our country. He has a remarkable mind for the business world, this young fellow. He goes to China to get all the practical work done, all the labor, because it's one third of what it will cost him to do in South Africa. Labor and material, including all the costs of bringing it back. No wonder China is just, I mean, they hardly make anything with the labor. There's hardly anything of taxes. No one, what can you do? Well, let's not go into politics now. But it's China's time, isn't it? I mean, we've got to pray about 
because we've all been living it. Anyway, this young couple now, flourishing, outlets in the malls of clothing, of all levels of clothing that he designs, gets the material, gets made and mass, brings back, and they're just a, a good quality. And so they sit with me now, save for just three, four years now, when I visited and they said, we have a crisis. What about Sunday? South Africa that used to fear God, no one worked on Sunday apart from police, ambulances and doctors. And I remember that as a boy, Albert, Melanie, our country once feared God. Sunday was a day when you didn't work. But today, we're so far from God in the generation I've lived that Sunday is the day they push to make money for selling, for shopping, the malls, everything, the entertainment in the mall, everything, just this is the day. Everybody now, that once God here in South Africa desecrates God's day. Charles Finney, that you can tell the spiritual state of a land by what happens on the Lord's day in that land. Finney said the first thing of any significance that he noticed of change in America when God swept through this land, the first thing he noticed was the way the land started to revere God's day. Work stopped across America. It became a holy day. He said you can feel the pulse of a land by just looking what happens across America on Sunday. You know how much that land fears God or serves God, Finney says. Staggering. They said to me, God is speaking to us. But what are we going to do? Sunday's the day. And if we stop and close our doors on these malls all over, on a Sunday, they will throw us out. Because one outlet somehow supports the next one because people come to you, but the others get affected when people see other needs. So it's going to stop and close a lot of business. If we close our doors, it's going to affect everybody. We'll be thrown out. What must we do? So I looked at them and I said, do what your conscience tells you. Honor God. Honor God. Well, they did. And, oh, did they tremble for a while. They were thrown out of some of the biggest, most beautiful malls. Just thrown out. Get out. Get out. But they made their way into other malls that allowed them and other outlets where suddenly there were people that they didn't realize would take a great percentage of their wear and sell in a different way as it became known that this was available at such a price. And they put on their shop doors in every mall. We are born again Christians. We love Jesus Christ with every faculty of our being and for this reason these doors are closed on Sundays that we may honor God's day, the Lord's day, and not desecrate it. That is on their doors as the people flock past to get their shopping done. Well, what happened? Brother, sister, this might be hard for you to comprehend. They so prospered 
They didn't double. They trebled the first year. They trebled that the second year. It just went on and on until they couldn't survive with all the work. How often Jenny will be my witness on the phone. They phone and say, we can't survive. It's just too much. God honors them that honor him, sir. God honors them that honor him. Don't doubt it now. Oh, to be honored by God. Don't compromise when it comes to any issue concerning your handling of money, whether it's on the Sabbath, the Lord's Day, New Testament wise, whether it's undermining the poor. You won't be judged how much money you made, sir. You'll be judged how you made it. How you got it. Don't doubt that now. Don't in any issue compromise when it comes to your handing the smallest penny in your life once you name the name of Jesus or you lose a sensitive walk with God. Don't lose that. It's not worth it. I remember when I was a young preacher in South Africa, my district superintendent came to me in a bit of a fluster and he said, Brother Keith, I'm in trouble. We have this conference, this convention, and we've got to leave early in the morning before the sun comes, and I didn't get certain things. I want you to get to the center of Pretoria before the shops close, and I want you to get these things in this shop, the only shop that sells these things. I can't do that. Don't you come back here and tell me you didn't make it. It's late, but if you rush, you get there in time. Don't you even think of coming back if you didn't get it. Well, that's tempting to break the speed limit, isn't it? When your boss says things like that, I didn't break the speed limit, but I made sure I didn't waste any time. I just made it. I got into the center of town, traffic hour and all. And I think there was about 15 minutes before the shop doors closed. It was really the end now in the city. And I got to this shop, this particular shop, and I got out the car and I felt for money, loose change, because the parking meter you could have paid to park in the center of town. Well, I didn't have the right change, so I thought, oh my. So I saw a man standing in one of the shops next to the shop where I had to go in and get these things in another shop, another outlet in the center of the town. He was standing at the end of the day, not very busy, obviously. He was the owner of the shop. He was a Greek man. So I went up to him and I said, sir, I need parking money because there's still time. We have to still pay. It's not five o'clock yet. He said, oh, don't worry, man. The police don't come here this time of the day. <laughs> He says, you, you just go, go do your thing. I said, no, I need the money. I, I'll get small change. I've got, I just haven't got the right. I'll give it back to you, but I just need to put it in. I want to. He says, I won't let you. <laughs> Don't be stupid. He said, I'm very, always very young, I suppose. He says, now you go do your work. I'll watch you. If a policeman comes, I'll go and put the money in fast. You won't get a fine. <laughs> How do you argue with this sort of man? So I went in and did all the work, got all the stuff. And I asked them for change and I came out, put all the stuff in the car. And then I got out the car again and I took the money, I got the small change. Now the time had passed. You don't have to pay anymore, by the way. But I put in because I had used time. Well, I get in the car again and I'm starting suddenly to the bang on the window. This fellow was angry, by the way. I put the window down. He says, are you mad? <laughs> so I saw I was in trouble. What's wrong with you? What do you put money in for now? I watch for you. I look for you. There's no policeman in sight. The time is gone. You come here, you still put money in. What's wrong with you? 
So I put the coins in open. I get out and I look at him. And I said, I put it in because I'm a Christian. I belong to God. I love God. He said, but I'm a Christian too. I said, no, you're not. I said, sir, the difference between your Christianity and mine is you will only do what you have to do if you're going to get caught or seen doing the wrong thing. I do what is right if no one is watching on earth or if everyone's watching me because God's watching me. That's what it real Christian is. He's the same whether a crowd is watching and witnessing whether he's going to fail or compromise on any issue. He's the same whether no one's watching because whatever he does, he does out of love for Jesus Christ and sensitivity toward the God who tells him to obey the law of the land. And to have a clear conscience Concerning the smallest issues. I said, you're not a Christian. You're going straight to hell. If you don't repent and come to Christ and live before God, not man. One of the great missionary ladies of our country by the by, you want women not to serve God. I looked at one man in your country who said something about women serving God across Africa. I said, sir, you give the command to get every woman missionary off the field. Two-thirds of the mission force in the world is gone. Be careful. I don't believe in domination of women going on against God's words, but be careful. In Africa, most souls who've come to Christ came through women who died in sickness because no man would go to the Congo where you die and die sick of diseases. Most men wouldn't do that. So God had to get little ladies who go down to the huts and be riddled with disease but bring them to Christ. But one of the great lady missionaries of our continent whose name is revered across Africa by the missions upon missions that were founded because of her zeal and the fruit of her life as she went to the soul. Helena Garrett. I heard an astounding incident in her life. She took a, a penny stamp for postage from a source where she was in a desperate situation and somehow she overlooked. And when she remembered that lady was in such a state to go to such extremities to get back to that situation before she could put and someone who had seen all that it cost her to get back and put that penny in place said to her was that necessary all that for a penny and that little lady said words that preachers across Africa have repeated this incident it so stunned the Christians of our country She said with tears in her eyes and shock on her face, Young man, if you steal a penny, in God's eyes, you may as well have st stolen a million pounds. There's no difference. There's no difference. You see, she says, the book says, he that's faithful in little is faithful in much. 
But if you're not faithful in the little things, you find, and she said the staggering statement, even if you're a preacher, young man, one day you'll be guilty of fraud with thousands of pounds. If you play the fool with the pennies, one day I guarantee you'll play the fool with the thousands. In God's eyes, that penny was as good as a million pounds. I had to bring it back. When God reminded me of it. Do you know how sensitive the Holy Spirit is, beloved? Is anything on earth worth losing a tender walk with God. Will you answer God, please? Your business. Is it worth it, sir? Is anything, anything, worth losing a tender walk with God? To the unsaved, I can just say, what are the profit if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You are a pauper what you lost in the light of eternity. And you Christians, you lose a tender walk with God. For what? All you find is misery while you profess to know Christ in your heart. I guarantee you, is it worth it? Even if it's a penny, it may as well be a million dollars, sir. You played the fool with to a holy God. Don't doubt that. Don't doubt it. My father, my father came to Christ and he staggered. He staggered multitudes of people with his integrity toward God. My father staggered us as a home when he confessed something we hadn't known. A great amount of the wealth he had accumulated in life had been accumulated wrongly. And he told us as a family He's going to get right concerning this with restitution. He went back to companies he worked for as a young man. Now he's gray and wrinkled. He went and he calculated out what it would be worth in our currency's valuation today of what he knew he took. And he made sure it was over what he took. And he made out checks for staggering amounts. And he kept going. He just stopped everything in life and went crisscrossing the country, flying around. And he sat with these men and said, when I was with you, I took thousands and thousands. And I want to pay it back. He made checks. And he told them why. I've come to Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. Do you know, in the end, they knew he was coming. The phone calls went around the business world. And when he walked in, they would stand up and say, No, we refuse to take anything from you, sir. One man weeping said, I won't take it from you, Mr. Daniel. I can't. He said, Sir, you sold waste. And we... We would have thrown it away, but you sold it. You did something. That isn't stealing. My father said, I should have told you how many thousands I was making daily with the waste. You would have taken it. I didn't tell you what you could do with it. I didn't do it honestly. And they said, sir, you didn't steal. Nobody that you've been to, nobody you're going to, will accept that you've stolen. They look upon you with integrity. As a man of integrity, 
What are you doing making us take this money? My father said, weeping, a man told me this. My daddy didn't tell me this. He said, when I said that to your daddy, you know what your daddy said? He said, please give me the right to die with nothing left that hasn't been made right in God's eyes. Give me that right. Do you know what they did? They phoned ahead, by the way. Everywhere they knew he was coming. And they decided how to word it. They said, if you make a check out, you make it out to a church or a missionary society for your God, for your God's work. We will not accept it. And I'm telling you now, Mr. Daniel, no one else is going to accept it. You give it to the church, wherever you feel led. They said, most of them with tears coming down their face. My daddy gave so much of what I one day could have inherited. And my brother, he left my mother well off, more well off than most ladies her age, right to this day. He didn't leave us an inheritance. I am going to get nothing. I got nothing. But do you know... He left me with more wealth than if he had left me with a billion pounds. He left me with a testimony that I revere and treasure that I was his son. That I have a father to testify across the world about who had no compromise on any issue in life. No one can point a finger to anything he didn't make restitution for he left us with wealth. That I would be in poverty if he left me with a billion dollars. I wouldn't have wanted it. God knows I'm true. In the place of what he did leave me with. Honor. 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 I have had to sit before many people who have had great wealth. When they come to me, town upon town, and tell me that they have had tax evasion involving millions. Now they want to see God. What does this mean? Now? What about this? You know why Jesus turned the rich young man away? Why he walked away from Christ? Because he had... Great wealth. He had too much to lose. Jesus doesn't expect everyone with wealth to give it up and give it so to the poor. But if that keeps you, if that stands between you and God, he touches it. He touches it. Straight away. And I've seen many a man walk away with a heavy heart like the rich young man because God touched that and they weren't willing what does it profit if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul, Jesus said? You're poverty stricken at death. And death is in a moment. That's all you've got, this moment called life. It's gone. So fast, it's fearful. If you don't know it yet, then you've got eternity. So, money is not the root of all evil, the love of money is. The love of money is. I've seen men who have wine farms of four generations worth millions of rands in our currency who want to come to God, who get right with God, and they say, what about this? Where a great percentage of our poor class lie drunk daily in the gutters. And they pay them with wine. So much of our population is destroyed by drink. People who want to argue about drinks, sir. If my eating meat causes anyone to stumble, I'll stop from eating meat. And if you look me in the eyes and tell me that there's no one stumbling, if I, as a priest,
preacher, drink alcohol. You tell me Jesus made wine? Sir, I don't want to argue with you on Greek and everything else, or Hebrew, of whether it was red or fermented. I just want to say this. In this moment of your life, if you can stand before God and say, my drinking, let others look at and say, when he does, I can. He names Christ, he preaches, he's born again. I can. And look at what percentage of the world lies drunk. They say, in the Western world, the bulk, the great majority of anyone, anyone who touches alcohol just once, become alcoholics. Argue with your governments if you don't believe it. That's what they say. And you, sir, the preacher, the professing Christian, says, no harm in this, you know. Well, these wine farmers ask me, one after the other, and all the wealth, and I said, sir, it's going to cost you. Oh, it's going to cost you. But it's going to cost you a billion times more if you don't do what your conscience says to be able to get right with God and have the right to carry his name in truth and not cause multitudes to stumble and go to hell through the way you made the money. Listen to this. They that will be rich, Timothy, 5 verse 6 They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil while which while some coveted after her have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows but thou O man of God flee these things Verse 17, charge them that are rich in the world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy that they may do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up a store for themselves and a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. God says, God's word. Oh, I could just go on all these verses. I was hungry. You fed me not. I was naked. You clothed me not. When did we see the hunger? Oh, sir. We're so blind to other people's needs that we can walk past a dying man and not have any compassion why we name the name of Jesus. That's possible. How dwelleth the love of God in you? If you have, and you see your brother have need, and you you give not, how can you say God is in you? John says. James cries out, how is you profess to know Christ and you see your brother have need. You see him naked, destitute of daily food and you give not that which is needful. How can you say, I, I have the love of God, I love God to anyone in this world? James says in chapter 5, it's not It's not how rich you are. It's how you got that money and what you did with it, if you got it, in this world that God will judge you for. Or don't you want to read James 5? I wonder what percentage of the Bible, if we're really honest, we'd be left with 
If we took a pair of scissors and cut out every single passage or word, we don't live. No, not for me. Oh, my. How can you carry a book as if you live it, sir? Prove God if you're faithful and you stagger the world the way God will honor you. Don't doubt that. The other option is compromise and you will be responsible for the most people in the world who know you and watch you while you profess to know Christ, you'll be responsible for them going to hell. Can we stand, please? I know, I know very few people dare preach what I've preached tonight. They probably will never be invited again to your country, let alone your pulpit. I ask every single person standing here tonight in the sight of God to walk from this day in the light of this message or stop professing to know Jesus Christ. You'll just do damage.